In, in classical mechanics, the uh, concept of a particle and fields developed at diff very different times. It was Newton, Isaac Newton, back at the end of the 17th century, who introduced the idea of a point particle, as it were, a piece of matter imagined shrunken to a point uh, as a way of, of simplifying the description of motion of objects. That's a very discrete description of, of dynamics. And it wasn't until the 19th century that James Clerk Maxwell uh, developed the first classical field theory, which was electromagnetic theory based on entities, electric and magnetic fields which exist throughout space and which are, th are therefore a continuum of, of, of quantities. Uh, the field idea was was very strange at the time and was met with quite a lot of scepticism. Uh, the rival theories of electromagnetism uh, were based, based on ideas of interaction of at a distance of point charges uh, analogous to Newton's ideas uh, and um, the field idea was so strange that my, Maxwell's friend Lord Kelvin over in Glasgow accused him of mysticism. The um, contribution of Einstein in uh, the theory of the photoelectric effect was, was uh, perhaps more important than uh, his uh, th special relativity theory. And in fact, it was what he got the Nobel Prize for. Um, and um, basically, he went further than Planck. Uh, and what, what the idea he had was later, I think, well summarized by uh, Feynman, who summarized the ideas of quantum mechanics as, in, as being, it comes in lumps. What comes in lumps are what we previously thought of as these continuous fields, like electromagnetic fields, and the lumps are the particles which we, which we observe, uh, which we detect in our, our machines. And the theory of the photoelectric effect was the first step towards that uh, duality between fields and particles. On the subject of, of relativity, I, I mean, the, the, the mickelson morley experiment is, uh, is usually s cited as the, the uh, sort of basic piece of experimental evidence uh, f from which you, you build r special relativity. But I have to say that the last few times I've taught special relativity to undergraduates, I've ignored the way that Einstein did it. And uh, I simply asked the question, how do you, how do you realize the principle of relativity, which was, was what, the, what was formulated by Henri Poincaré? And if you just go through a few lines of, of algebra, you uh, discover that if you do not make Newton's assumption of absolute time, then you have uh, an, an unknown constant in the tr equations which transform from one frame of reference to another, uh, which you will later identify as being the square of the quantity C, which happens to be something to do with light. But r the development of r relativ special relativity need not have had anything to do with the michelson wall experiment. First of all, I, 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 I point out that um, quantum electrodynamics was first, first set, set up in the form of a quantum theory of, of Maxwell's electromagnetic field by Paul Dirac. And what he was doing was providing the, the theoretical framework for what in Einstein's work in 1905 was, was a rather brilliant idea which simply didn't fit in with the previous classical ideas at all. Uh, later on, the um, quantum electrodynamics as the th quantum theory of uh, interacting uh, photons and electrons 
uh, became the first very successful quantum field theory in the sense that it made extremely accurate predictions. Uh, that didn't happen until uh, around 1950, and previously it had gone through a rather dis difficult period where people didn't understand how to inter handle infinite quantities which occurred in, in the formalism. Uh, we'll, we'll be coming back to infinite quantities uh, in the context of other interactions la later in this series. Um, the, the other point I would pick up is the, the matter of symmetries. The importance of symmetries in uh, classical mechanics has already uh, been referred to in the first week. Uh, however, that's very late development in classical mechanics. It, it, the connection between symmetries and con conservation laws didn't r really get properly formalized till the work of, of Emmy Noether in the um, early 20th century. Uh, but, but from the point of view of, of uh, the, these, these uh, these lectures, uh, the relation between symmetries and conservation laws is a very important idea. Well, for, for a long time, uh, renormalization looked like uh, just a, a, a neat trick for hiding nasty things under the carpet, as it were. In other words, in the when it arrived in in the work of uh, Feynman, Schwinger, Tomonaga, Dyson, around 1950, uh, then it it uh, it was a way of finding how to how to, how to calculate uh, finite answers from a finite input. But the finite input had had to be the experimental values of uh, the ele electron. Uh, mass and the electron charge, which are not the same as the parameters which appear, appear in the original uh, quantum field equations. Uh, that was the basic trick. Uh, but it, it wasn't, uh, I think, until um, much later the work of people like uh, Ken Wilson bringing in ideas from statistical physics, where there's also a problem of renormalization, but not necessarily involving in infinite quantities uh, it doesn't it, 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 you don't have that same same difficulty with condensed matter systems um, it, it was only then I think that people realized that 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 really renormalization uh, wasn't just a way of getting rid of nasty infinities but it was a way of understanding scales in in the theory Well, from the point, point of view of, 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 of somebody who did theoretical work in the uh, early 60s, uh, a lot of this is, is, is jumping, jumping ahead in time, or rather. Uh, if I go back to the early 60s, the, there were difficulties in the theory um, for which we now have solutions, um, but no coherent theoretical framework for dealing with them. The uh, situation which had developed was that, first of all, when quantum field theory ideas, which had been so successful in electrodynamics, were applied to strong forces, they, they, they didn't give um, they didn't give good predictions. The, 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 the agreement between theory and experiment was always very bad. Some people thought that was, this was simply because the uh, coupling strength, in terms of which you make a series expansion, was too big to, for you to be able to do this at all. Uh, we now know that we simply had the wrong uh, model of uh, strong interactions. We thought that protons and neutrons and other uh, uh, strongly interacting particles that we observe were elementary, and that meant that the 
theory that was based on, on those ideas was almost bound to give uh, the wrong answers. Uh, quarks didn't, didn't really arrive as, as being uh, something with an experimental basis until about 1970. Uh, which was several years after the theoretical work that I've been involved in. And in fact, it took several years, I think, for the idea of quarks to be generally accepted, despite the strength of the experimental evidence. Um, both, uh, both Weinberg and I remained skeptics for several more years. I'm, I'm prepared to admit it. He, he, he's embarrassed about it. <laughs> uh, I was finally convinced in 1974 by the JPSI discovery. Uh, but that was the one um, kind of difficulty which was not being coped with in the early 60s. Uh, the other was that the uh, theory of, of weak forces uh, was was just uh, it was it 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 wasn't just wrong it 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 was it was it was ridiculous it it led to infinite answers that the people did not know how to sweep under the carpet unlike quantum electrodynamics the the by then uh, a number of people had categorized uh, simple quantum quantum field theories of various sorts according to whether they would be renormalizable or not. And the candidate theories for the weak force were simply not renormalizable, and that was a real headache. In, in the early 60s, there was not yet a standard model. Uh, the the uh, developments that Brout and Anglais, Giraldic, Hagen and Kibble and I were involved in in 1964, were the beginning of of what uh, eventually became the standard model, uh, because they led to a solution for one of the problems that had plagued the theory, uh, namely the the difficulties associated with the with the weak force. Though none of us in 1964 actually saw that that was the way to, to go with the theory. The, the, um, the, the, the people who were involved in the work in 64 were a, a, a kind of minority in, in the theoretical particle physics community in the sense that they still played around with quantum field theories despite its failures. And, uh, the inspiration for the uh, the, the work uh, was, in fact, uh, back in 19, uh, 1957, uh, the Bardeen Cooper Schrieffer theory of superconductivity in metals and alloys. Uh, and the person who uh, got the idea that the ideas which went into uh, BCS theory of superconductors uh, might also have a role in particle physics. Well, first, first of all, Yoichiro Nambu at the University of Chicago, and uh, uh, shortly afterwards, Jeffrey Goldstone of the University of Cambridge. Now, the uh, ideas which were taken over from uh, superconductivity theory were the concept associated with what's called spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is where you have a, a system in which the phenomena have less symmetry than the underlying dynamics. And the reason the phenomena have less symmetry, that, that by, the, by phenomena I mean the behavioral particles in the theory, the reason is that the lowest energy state, which we call the vacuum, where there are no particles, breaks the symmetry. It's an asymmetric state with respect to some symmetry in the th dynamics. Um, that is a, a feature which is very important for superconductivity to work, 
and in superconductivity it's associated with a phenomenon known as post-condensation, which is the uh, condensation of a macroscopically large number of spinless particles into a single quantum state, and that post-condensate is what carries the current in a superconductor. Now the phenomenon of of both condensation, which has more recently been exhibited in other, other systems as well, uh, is uh, intimately associated with spontaneous symmetry breaking in these systems. So uh, what happened in 1960 was that Nambu and also Goldstone uh, tried to see how this would work for particle physics in quantum field theory models. And they were thinking, as everybody, or, or nearly everybody at that time did think, in terms of broken flavor symmetries in strong interactions. So Nambu uh, formulated models uh, which were, were based on, in fact, massless protons and neutrons, which acquired mass as a consequence of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, and uh, they were based on BCS theory uh, and a difficulty arose which was that uh, in the spectrum of, of the states there were massless particles of spin zero which became known as Goldstone bosons because it was Goldstone who gave a simple interpretation of why it should happen. Um, Goldstone's work was, was similar to Nambu's, but conceptually simpler because whereas Nambu stuck close to uh, realistic superconduct superconductors in, in the sense that he started from, from fermionic quantities, spin half, uh, Goldstone realized that the, the basic phenomena were the results of what could be very easily described in terms of of bosonics, that is, spin zero fields, uh, and the kind of models which which Goldstone formulated were were very close to what, in superconductivity theory, goes back to work of uh, Ginzburg and Landau in 1950 where they pointed out that you could, you could make a superconductor by forming a Bose condensate of charged spin zero particles, but no, nobody knew where, where to get the charged spin zero particles. They, in the end, had to be composite objects uh, in BCS. So, in parallel, you had these, these two uh, sort of frameworks uh, for spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, Nambu's program and the parallel ideas of Goldstone and Goldstone's way of understanding why there should be the massless spin zero particles was the easier one to, to, to understand. It was conceptually simpler and it was, it was to do with the uh, fact that if you write down a simple model as Goldstone did, uh, you have in it a Mexican hat potential, as in that corner of the portrait. Uh, and uh, w when you have uh, that kind of potential involving uh, fields, continuous quantities, rather than uh, a marble or something rolling around a glass bowl, uh, what happens is that you you have uh, uh, some massive particles associated with with the uh, way it, where, where the the thing goes up and down the the slopes of the potential radially, but but if you if you have something which is is excited around the trough. That needs no energy, and the consequence of needing no energy is that the uh, particles involved have no mass, and that's uh, a necessary consequence of that 
uh, way of spontaneously broken symmetry. Uh, so in 1964, um, some of us, uh, at least, uh, certainly uh, Kiralnik, Haig, and Kibble and myself, were worrying about the Goldstone theorem and, and how to uh, uh, avoid having this phenomenon because uh, if you have massless particles uh, in nature, uh, massless spin zero particles, they, they get radiated very easily. Experimentalists can produce them very easily. There's no energy threshold, and they would have been known long, long ago, and there aren't any. Uh, so um, th that was the, uh, the the one motivation for for the the, the work of uh, of four, four of us. Um, in in Brussels, uh, Angler and Braut um, were also inspired by the work, the work of Nambu and, and others. Uh, they had, uh, were people who'd, who'd worked previously in condensed matter physics. So they, they had a sort of background in which spontaneous symmetry breaking is much better known than, than, in, than to particle physicists. And... Uh, the earliest work in 1964 was actually the work of Broughton on there in Brussels, uh, though they did, didn't publish in, in, until some time later. Uh, and they uh, wrote down uh, simply some Feynman diagrams for a, a, a system in which Spontaneous symmetry breaking occurred, inspired by by Nambu and Goldstone, uh, and the the new element that they put in was that some of the some of the fields were uh, so-called gauge fields, like Maxwell fields, which hadn't hadn't been in the work of of Nambu and Goldstone, and they discovered that just by doing a, a very simple that Feynman diagram calculation, um, the uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking generated mass for the uh, quanta of the gauge field. In fact, the uh, gauge field picked up an extra degree of freedom, which was the Goldstone degree of freedom, and turned what would otherwise have been photons of zero mass into uh, spin one particles with mass and three different states of spin. Um, a bit of history, history were told to me by by um, uh, by Brout years ago was that he he then phoned Abdus Salam, who'd been one of the people who'd produced a, a mathematical proof of the Goldstone theorem along with Weinberg, and uh, told him of their result and said it's puzzling. We've got something which seems to contradict your theorem. He didn't get Salam on the phone, and he didn't get a reply. <laughs> uh, but the two people in Brussels were, were, were worried they'd made a mistake. They were inexperienced in doing uh, things in relativistic field theory. Um, so the actual order of events was that in, in July 1964, I suddenly realized that the way out of the axioms of this theorem was uh, to introduce a Maxwell type of theory because a, a gauge theory has got some uh, some ambiguities uh, where, where, you, where you, you have to fix the gauge to define the, the, the variables and this destroyed the proof of the theorem so I simply uh, published a, a paper which uh, said this is the way out of the Goldstone theorem, got it accepted by physics letters, and then I sat down and wrote down the simplest model in, in, in which was relativistic in which it would happen. And this was essentially uh, a marriage of a model in Goldstone's paper with Maxwell. And uh, that's the yes. equations uh, up on, on the portrait there. Uh, and what surprised me was that that paper got rejected uh, by physics letters. And it was a, as a consequence of that rejection 
that I, uh, I added a couple of paragraphs, and I pointed out that there was a, an interesting feature of models of this type, which was that there would always be leftover massive spin zero particles, which now get called Higgs bosons. Uh, uh, I also sent the paper across the Atlantic to physical review letters, where I thought they might have referees who understood what I was doing better. Uh, they did. The referee were, actually was Nambu, as I learned later. And it was Nambu who, in uh, recommending approval of uh, publication of my paper, who asked me uh, to comment on the work of uh, Ongler and Brout, which had been published on the day that my paper arrived in the Physical Review Letters office. I think at first I should I should go further back because uh, before I comment on the experimental search, um, I should I, I should stress that what 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 was being looked for was 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 not uh, quite what the theorists uh, were thinking of in 1964 because when. The six of us in 1964 were, were doing this theoretical work. We were still thinking very much in terms of applying it to the broken flavor symmetries of the strong interactions. And um, I mean, those of us who tried to do it discovered it, it didn't work. And it wasn't until three years later that uh, Weinberg realized that everybody been, had been looking at the wrong application that, and that it should be the, the, uh, the mechanism, the uh, route on the Higgs mechanism, should be applied to electroweak theory, the Glashauer model, uh, which he did, and so did Salam. And furthermore, it still wasn't clear, even in 1967, that you could really uh, calculate without uh, the theory crushing with infinities, and it required the work of Veltman and then Toft, uh, uh, Toft work published 1971, to, to show that the whole thing was viable. Where, when, the, when that became, became viable um, as a, a real theory, with, with real calculations in 1971. Uh, that's when the, uh, well, 71, 72, uh, the, there was a sort of bandwagon effect. The th all the theorists who, who had been ignoring quantum field theory climbed back into the quantum th field theory bandwagon and it, it became a fashionable thing to do. Uh, before it became, uh, of interest to experimentalists, uh, we had to have the discovery of the neutral currents of the Glashow electroweak theory, and that was 1973. Uh, and once that had happened, uh, then experimentalists started taking the whole thing seriously too. So that by the time I uh, spent a, a couple of months at CERN in the autumn of 76. Um, people were, were beginning to plan the, the, the experiments which would test the electroweak theory. And at that stage, the machine was LEP. LEP was being planned. Um, the Large Electron Positron Collider. A year before I, I went to CERN, uh, John Ellis, Mary Kay Gaillard, and Dimitri Nanopoulos had written a paper called The Phenomenology of the Higgs Boson, in which they, they, they sort of hinted very gently that experimentalists ought to be aware of this extra feature of, of the electroweak theory. There was this, this leftover massless spin zero particle. And at the end they said, oh, because we, we, we aren't able to tell you uh, on the basis of present knowledge very much about it. We have no way of fixing the parameters. Uh, 
we don't want to start a big experimental search, but we think that people who do, do experiments in which it might have an influence should look out for it. And that was when it began. So there was the first phase in which uh, LEP, was, LEP was built. And as, uh, as, as I'm sure you know, you, you, you're, you're well aware, uh, even building LEP was a, a long, difficult program. Uh, I mean, it was, it was thought up in the, in the early 70s, and it um, started up, when was it, 79? Eight, 89. 89. Okay. So it's, um, it's about 15 years. Uh, 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 because, the, I mean, there were big, big, pro big problems in building that sort of machine at, at all. And it's at this stage, and also big problems building detectors. And I think it's at this stage that the experimental collaborations begin to grow in size. Not, a, not to the scale of the LHC collaborations, but lab collaborations were already uh, substantially up from, from the sort of collaborations which had uh, discovered the neutral currents, for example, or the, uh, or the, or the work which, which, had, which later on, uh, thanks to Simon van der Meer and Carl Rubia, uh, actually produced the weak bosons. So uh, the experimental pr program became a very large-scale effort in many ways. Um, and w when it came to the, the end of, um, of the LEP program, well, long before uh, people at CERN had, had, and also across the Atlantic had been thinking, thinking of the next generation of machines, um, it, it, it was clear that you know, it was going to be an even bigger uh, and longer development to produce things like the LHC and the ill-fated SSC in Texas uh, because of uh, such difficulties as the need to, to uh, make superconducting magnets to, to get the magnetic field intensities ne needed for the higher energies and the you know, vast developments in sophistication of com com computer pro programs for uh, reconstructing the, the collisions and analyzing the data. And uh, by, by the time the uh, LHC w w got, w was, was really re ready to, to, to go, um, experimental physics in, in, in particle physics had, had, had grown several order, orders of magnitude, I think, in scale. And it's been a really uh, her heroic e e effort um, on, on the part of, of many kinds of people, the, the builders of the machines, the, the uh, developers, developers of the computer s systems, uh, uh, to do it at all. Uh, and uh, I think what what is what, what has ha happened in the last year or two, w which was the, six, the, the first big success of the LHC in, in actually identifying this, this uh, particle which, which, which was thought up in 1964 or earlier, it, this is, a, this is a, a, a really heroic effort compared with the sort of, you know, small scale effort of the theorists back in the 60s.